Well, welcome everybody. So today we will have a webinar which is actually going to focus on uh, the dissection of the neural circuits that are controlling innate behaviors. So innate behaviors are also known as instinct behaviors. And I can see here some examples like uh, mating behaviors, aggression, and also uh, parental behaviors. We'll in particular focus uh, during this webinar on parental behaviors and on the neural circuits that are involved in these uh, parental behaviors. So in the order of speakers, oops, no, this is not going. So actually, I will start uh, with talking about the development of the neural circuits underlying on innate behaviors, but I'm actually more working on reproductive behavior. So I will give you an overview uh, of the neural circuits important in particular uh, regarding the development of these uh, neural circuits. This will be followed by Ariana Sharif, which will be talking about cell plasticity in the maternal brain. Then uh, Nicolas Renier will talk about the control of maternal nesting during pregnancy, and this will be uh, followed by a talk by Christian Broberger on brain and neuroendocrine mechanisms of male parental behavior. So my talk is, as said before, I'm gonna talk about the neural circuits that in particular are important in reproductive behavior. And so we know there are important sex differences in reproduction. And for instance, we can look at the mating behaviors. And for instance, in rodents, there is this very typical uh, posture, uh, which is receptivity in the female rat. This is called the lordosis behavior. As you can see in this picture, the female rat will actually arch her back in response to the mounting of a male. And this posture makes it possible for the male to intermit the female and to fertilize the female. We also have important sex differences in the regulation of what we call of the sex hormone production or which is under the influence of the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. We have a cyclical function in females. This is the estrous cycle or menstrual cycle in women, whereas in male, there's a more kind of tonic regulation of sex hormone production. So what about the origin of sex differences in reproductive functioning? Well, actually, I'm going to focus on what we call uh, the sexual differentiation of behavior. And those are actually uh, based on experiments that have basically been done last century in uh, rodent species. I'm just giving you an overview, a very brief overview of how actually this takes place. So if we take in rats, male rats, you have a male pup and you leave it undisturbed. Well, this male will show what we call typical male behaviors in adulthood that will say he will be mounting a female. So females, so when uh, you leave them undisturbed and then in adulthood, she will show this, this uh, well-known lordosis posture when she is mounted by a male. However, if you castrate the male just after birth, so you remove the testes and you remove testosterone and then in adulthood, you will treat this particular male with what we call estradiol and progesterone, which is known as female typical hormones. This male will actually show female typical sexual behavior, will show the dosis behavior when mounted by another male. It will no longer actually show the typical male mounting behavior. Conversely, if you treat female pups right after birth with testosterone, and you've provided her as well with testosterone in adulthood, she will actually show what we call male typical sexual behavior. She will mount other females and she will no longer show this typical female lordosis behavior. And so what is happening actually early in life, that is what we call organizational effects of sex hormones on the brain, because these effects are really permanent. A male that has been castrated after birth will no, never show any male typical sexual behavior, even if you give him high doses of testosterone. And likewise with the female, if you have provided her with male typical hormones, testosterone, she will no longer show low doses behavior in adulthood, even if you give her estradiol and progesterone. However, in adulthood, this is what we call the activational effects of sex hormones because they are irre irreversible, they're not permanent. You can, for instance, take a male rat, you castrate the male, you take away testosterone, he will start showing male typical behavior. But if you provide this male with testosterone, he will resume showing this kind of behavior. So based on this particular diagram, it looks like if you castrate a male, so you take away testosterone after birth, the male will show female typical behavior. So in the absence of testosterone, you have female typical sexual behavior. And so 
this has been sort of regarded as being a default organization that is in the absence of sex hormones. But is this really the case? Well, actually, using more uh, modern uh, models, uh, if you're looking at lordosis behavior, is actually that there is a role of acetyl in feminizing the brain. So this was based on a mouse model, which is called the aromatist knockout mouse. So in order for acetyl to be produced, it has to be converted from testosterone by the enzyme aromatase to acetyl. And in this particular mouse model, uh, there is a mutation in the aromatase gene, so these mice can no longer uh, produce any estradiol. So based on the default uh, developmental programming females, these females should not be affected. However, if you look in this particular diagram, it's just an overview and sort of summary of results. If you have a wild type female, she will show typical lordosis behavior. And in an aromatase knockout female, actually we found very little lordosis behavior. This lordosis behavior is usually being expressed as a lordosis quotient. That is actually the number of lordosis uh, of the female in response to the mouse. We have one, that means that every mount by the male was followed by a lordosis. However, interestingly, if you treat female mice, aromatase knockout mice with estradiol over a very specific period during postnatal life, this is actually on postnatal day 15, to 25, we can actually induce lordosis behavior in these females. So suggesting that there is a specific period during development in which acetyl has feminizing actions on the brain. So of course the next question, uh, so this also shows there is no default organizational uh, uh, effect in females. They need to have acetyl over a specific prepubertal period. So the next question was of course that we are interested in what are the potential targets of this estradiol during the pre-puberty uh, pubertal period. And so we focus actually on kispeptin. Well, kispeptin is an interesting uh, peptide that got discovered in 2002, 2003, based on human genetic studies. Actually, this is on the right side. We have the hypothalamic uh, pituitary gonadal axis. We have gene rates, nerves, and hypothalamus stimulating the pituitary to produce LH, FSH, and that stimulates the gonads to produce sex steroids. But there always has been sort of like an, an, uh, an, an, an unknown factor. How was the how are the steroid hormones actually influencing uh, the gene rates neuronal activity? Because we know that it's on the, uh, regulated by uh, sex steroids. Well, kispeptin, as I said, was discovered few uh, actually genetic mutations in uh, human population. Actually, people that have a mutation in the kispeptin peptide, the gene encoding the kispeptin peptide or its receptor GPR54 are showing hypergonotropic hypergonadism. So they have no uh, pubertal maturation, they have no sex hormone production. And actually kispeptin turned out to be a missing link in this uh, particular axis because kispeptin actually expressed steroid receptor and can be directly affected by, uh, by sex steroid hormones. So we focus on kispeptin. Why? Because, well, it, in rodents, there are two important uh, neuronal populations. There's one in the interventral periventricular area and one in the arcuate nucleus, but there are important sex differences in the AVPV with having actually greater numbers of kispeptin neurons in females compared to males. So that was one observation. And it was also interesting to note that this particular uh, population develops during the prepubertal period on the influence of estrogens. And actually, if you look in aromatase knockout mice, so here we have the sex difference in uh, kispeptin neurons with female wild type animals having higher numbers, greater numbers than the males. But in the aromatase knockout females, you see a much lower number of kispeptin neurons. And we know that if you uh, give them estradiol during a prepubertal period, you can increase these numbers of kispeptin neurons. So that was one observation. So it's really dependent on prepubertal acetyl. And second observation was actually quite interesting. If you expose female mice to male odors, you can have an activation, specific activation of these kispeptin neurons in females exposed to male odors. So we first look at the role of kispeptin in what we call olfactory driven mate preferences. So in this case, we use a free compartment uh, box in which we put stimulus animals in the lateral compartments. There's the experimental female in the middle. She can, there are holes here in this size. She cannot see the animals, but she can sniff. So it's really an olfactory uh, stimulus. 
And what we found in a first experiment, we used actually KISS knockout mice. And so we look at preference score. So a positive score is where she has a preference for the male and a negative is for the female. So in wild type controls, we found they have a preference for male odors. And this was absent in the KISS knockout. And then when you actually inject them just with KISS peptin, you can induce a very strong male directed preference in these KISS knockout females. Of course, KISS knockouts are general knockouts, so they don't have KISS peptin uh, from autogeny on, so they do not have any sex steroid hormone production during development. So it could also be that this is an effect of a different uh, altered sexual differentiation of their brain. So therefore we use a different kind of strategy in which you actually ablated AVP, AVPV kispeptinurs in kiss cream mice by injecting a AAV caspase free dependent virus. And what you can see, there's a very strong decrease in the number of kispeptin cells. So this is all done, of course, in adulthood. So you have no interference or you're not interfering with the development of the system. And, and then if you look at the preference score, so again, here we have the queen negative controls on the left, we see that, uh, they show a preference for the male, but in the CRE uh, positive that has been in which kispeptin neurons were ablated, we see there's no longer a preference for the male, but we could induce this preference by injecting kispeptin. So of course, the next question was, does kispeptin act through the GPR gene or AIDS system? As I've shown before, it's a very strong uh, upstream regulation of gene or AIDS neurons. And so we actually use a mouse model in which GPR54 expressing neurons were specifically ablated, again, in adulthood, so not to interfere with the development, by injecting a, a diphtherian toxin. And so that will eliminate a GPR54 expressing neurons, including the gene or AIDS neurons. And we found that they no longer show any male directed preference. So actually a positive score is a male preference and negative is a female preference. We also use another model actually for looking at the role of gene or AIDS neurons, and we use what we call gene or AIDS dicer. So those that is dicer is the enzyme important for microRNAs, and this is a very interesting model because during puberty, actually gene or AIDS neurons seem to disappear. It's not that they die, but they no longer actually uh, secrete gene or AIDS. So it's an, a model that actually is uh, is valid for studying the absence of gene or AIDS secretion. And if you look at uh, mate preferences in these females, so we have here the, the, the controls and we use different kinds of conditions. So if you look on the saline condition, we see there is not a preference for males in the dicer, but you could induce a male directed preference by injecting gene or AIDS, but not by kispeptin and showing that kispeptin is most likely acting for gene or AIDS in inducing male directed preferences. So then, of course, as talk, we talk mate preferences, we also are interested in lordosis behavior. And so this is just in a group of wild-type females. You can very nicely induce lordosis behavior by injecting kispeptin, which is shown here. And of course, as being expected, lordosis behavior was disruptive in the kiss knockout mice, as you can see in this particular graph, but was rescued by just a simple peripheral, peripheral in, injection with kispeptin. So of course, the kiss knockout mice, again, we could have the filamental aspect. So we use the same strategy as shown with the mate preference. So in this case, again, we ablated specifically AVPV kiss peptin neurons in kiss cream mice. And so we found there was a strong reduction in low doses behavior and which could be rescued again by injecting simply subcutaneously uh, kiss peptin. So then, of course, we have been inhibiting lordosis behavior, which so that is an ablation. But we also want to see the reverse, so like do we actually induce lordosis behavior if you actually activate and stimulate these neurons? So in this case, we use kiss cream mice, in which we stimulated uh, with channel reduction, so optogenetically. So if you can see here, we use the um, here the, the 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 optical fibers and. And if you actually, this is showing electrophysiology, if you uh, turn on the blue light, you can uh, activate these case peptin neurons. And so when we turn on the blue light in a behavioral test paradigm, so in this case, the females, the moment that the male was approaching the female, we turn on the light, we, we, we observe that stimulating the females induced lordosis behavior. So again, as with the mate preferences, 
we were sort of thinking, well, okay, uh, let's just confirm in a way that kispeptin is also acting for generates neurons in stimulating lordosis behavior. And so this was a kind of a surprising result because in the generates uh, dicer mice, which had no longer generates neurons, we found absolutely no effect on lordosis behavior. Mate preferences were very clearly affected, but not lordosis behavior. And in, interestingly as well, just injecting generates in kiss knockout mice failed to induce lordosis in these mice. So we're looking for maybe other uh, downstream pathways of the AVPV kispeptin neurons. And so we use this particular mouse model of genetic tracing, which is the KISS-CRE uh, mouse in which expressing Bardin lectin. And so Bardin lectin is also going retrograde and anterograde. So in order to be sure that we are actually um, targeting the AVPV injected of CRE, general adoption CRE dependent virus into the AVPV. And then we looked to where these neurons were projecting and we identified actually a specific uh, neuronal population in the ventromedial hypothalamus. And we also observed that these neurons actually express a NOS. And NOS is a nitric oxide synthase enzyme. It's important for the production of the neurotransmitter nitric oxide. So the next question was, what is the role of nitric oxide in lordosis behavior, and could these neurons be a potential downstream relay of AVPV kispeptin neurons? So we first looked in a general knockout mouse model. So uh, we had NOS uh, knockout mice, and we observed there was a strong decrease in lordosis behavior in these mice, but could be rescued by giving a, a not an NO donor, which is called SNAP. We also found that we could not induce any lordosis behavior in NOS knockout mice by injecting either kispeptin or generates, which sort of confirmed that it's a downstream relay. And we also found, interestingly, that if you give the NOS, the nitric oxide donor, you could stimulate lordosis behavior in KISS knockout mice. So in the final slide, um, we were going to test whether this is really the NOS neurons in the ventromedial hypothalamus, whether they are important in lordosis behavior. So we actually directly injected kispeptin in this brain region, and we were able to stimulate lordosis behavior. But we also, by giving a specific inhibitor of NOS, which is l name, we could actually decrease lordosis behavior. So to take it all together, in the summary, you can actually say that there are probably two different kind of neuronal pathways, uh, which is important for either lordosis behavior or male preference. We know that male odors are very important in stimulating uh, these, uh, these behaviors. We know that it's being uh, detected process through the uh, vomer nasal pathway, pathway, the VNO, then there's an activation of kispeptin neurons in the AVPV and either acting through generates neurons in uh, stimulating male preferences and clear there's a relay from kispeptin neurons in the AVPV to the VMH and that is important in lordosis behavior. So just uh, to finalize this, the acknowledgements, of course, I have uh, several people that have been working uh, throughout the years on this particular project. And I would like to thank also my collaborators that have been helping me out with the different uh, transgenic mouse models. And I would like to thank you for your attention. So I think that now it's time to go to our next speaker, which is Ariana Schaaf. And she's going to talk about, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And so she's going to talk about the cell plasticity in the maternal brain. Yes, thank you, Julie. I'm sharing my screen. Uh, can you, sorry, can you see it correctly, full screen? Okay, thank you. Uh, so yes, today I'm going to speak about cell plasticity in the maternal brain. So I, I used a very general term of cell plasticity to speak about uh, the production of new cells in mature neural circuits. So this is a drastic form of plasticity. And as you know, there are many other forms of plasticity, such as uh, uh, gene expression plasticity, morphological plasticity, for instance, dendritic plasticity or phenotypic plasticity uh, and uh, synaptic plasticity. And uh, a physiological condition that is associated to major modifications in the brain uh, is pregnancy. 
And so here I chose just two examples of structural and uh, cell plasticity in the maternal brain. So a well-known example of structural plasticity occurs in the, in the hippocampus during pregnancy uh, that is associated to uh, increased uh, density of uh, dendritic spine. And this has been related to uh, increased uh, cognitive abilities, at least in rodents. And uh, in the olfactory bulb, there is increased neurogenesis uh, during pregnancy. So as you may know, uh, there are neural stem cells that persist in the, in the adult brain, in the adult rodent brain. And these neural stem cells line the, the lateral ventricles and they differentiate into neural progenitors that migrate along a rostral migratory stream to reach the olfactory bulb where they differentiate into olfactory interneurons that have been uh, involved in uh, olfactory functions such as olfactory discrimination. And this is a process that occurs continuously during adult life and that is particularly increased uh, during pregnancy and uh, is been shown to be regulated by, uh, by prolactin. And uh, we think that uh, this is part of the mechanism that promotes maternal behavior by uh, uh, promoting the olfactory uh, interaction between the mother and the pups. Another brain region that is uh, critical for, uh, for uh, mothers is the hypothalamus that regulates osmoregulation metabolism that are drastically modified during uh, pregnancy. And the hypothalamus also controls parturition, lactation, and maternal behaviors. And all these uh, uh, functions are uh, mediated by the activity of different neural circuits located in different hypothalamic nuclei. And since a few years, uh, there is an accumulation of studies that have shown cell plasticity in the adult hypothalamus with the production of uh, new neural cells, both neurons and glial cells. So there are different uh, experimental strategies that have been used to, to study this cell plasticity. Most studies use BRDU, and I will uh, come back to this later. And here, this is an example of uh, the production of new neurons in the, in the tuberal region of the, of the hypothalamus. And to probe the function of uh, this uh, cell plasticity, uh, we usually block the production of new cells by uh, inhibition strategies. And uh, the most common inhibition strategies are uh, uh, based on the induction of, uh, in the, sorry, in the, a treatment with anti-mitotic drugs such as uh, ARASI. And such studies have shown that the newborn cells in the adult hypothalamus are involved in the regulation of major hypothalamic functions such as energy metabolism, reproduction, in particular uh, ovarian cyclicity, thermoregulation, and sleep. However, uh, whether cell plasticity occurs in the maternal hypothalamus and is involved in the control of maternal physiology and behavior remained unexplored. And this is the, the question that uh, we started to answer uh, uh, here. So in this project, uh, we first looked at proliferation in the adult female uh, rat uh, hypothalamus. So to study uh, cell plasticity, we use BRDU for bromodeoxynuridine. So this is a, a timidine analog that incorporates, in, incorporates into DNA when cells go through the S phase of the cell cycle, and it is transmitted uh, to the daughter cells. So when we inject BRDU and we analyze the animals uh, right after, a few hours after, uh, we can probe cell proliferation by uh, immunolabeling for uh, BRDU. And if we wait longer, uh, if we wait for weeks or even months, this enables the newborn cell to, to differentiate. And when we analyze the animals at these long time points, we can analyze survival of the newborn cells and their differentiation by performing co-immunolabelings between BRDU and uh, markers of the different types of neural cells. So uh, we started to probe cell proliferation in, uh, in the adult female rat preoptic region. So we first focus 
on the preoptic region that is involved in the control of reproduction, uh, osmoregulation, and also that is critically involved in, uh, in the control of maternal behavior. And we looked at the proliferation uh, during the different phases of the oestrus cycle, uh, which lasts four days in rodents. And as you can see here, we could detect proliferation, ongoing proliferation in the adult female rat preoptic region. And this proliferation varied across the oestrus cycle with a peak in the oestrus two and uh, a minimum in oestrus. So then we reason that uh, the, the goal of, uh, of an estrus cycle is to produce an oocyte that will be fertilized and that will lead to a pregnancy. So we thought to explore uh, what is the fate of the newborn cells if a pregnancy occurs. So for that purpose, we injected bromodeoxyuridine in the estrus two when the proliferation peaks. And then we put the females in the presence or absence of a male to induce or not a pregnancy. And we analyze the BRDU population two or three weeks later. And we quantified the, the number of BRDU positive cells in the different uh, nuclei of the preoptic region that you see here, the AVP, the AVPV, the MEPO, and the MPOA for the medial preoptic area. And interestingly, we found that pregnancy significantly increased the total number of newborn cells, so in pregnant versus non-pregnant rats, and this selectively occurred in the, uh, in the medial preoptic area and not in the other nuclei of the preoptic region. And we could see this effect both uh, at two weeks and three weeks after the BRDU injection. So this means that pregnancy selectively increases the, the pool of newborn cells in the, in the MPO, in the medial preoptic area. So our next, next uh, question was to, um, to determine the phenotype of these newborn cells. So right after the, the injection of BRDU, uh, we performed different uh, co-immunolabelings and we found that 80% of the BRDU positive cells co-expressed the, the markers OLIC2 and NG2, which are two markers specific for the oligodendrocyte precursor cells, the OPCs. Then we looked at later time points to see if these newborn cells differentiated into uh, mature neural cells. And so here we perform co-immunolabeling co between BRDU and astrocytic markers, uh, GFAP and S100 beta, but we could never find any co-immunolabeling, meaning that there was no uh, production of astrocytes. And we did the same uh, for neurons by co-labeling for BRDU and the ponderonal marker HUCD. And here again, we couldn't find any uh, co-labeling, meaning that there is no neurogenesis. So then we looked into more details at the uh, oligodendroglial lineage that is schematized here. So OPCs proliferate and differentiate into mature oligodendrocytes that can then become myelinating oligodendrocytes. And all these different steps are characterized by the expression of specific markers. So for instance, OPCs express SOX2 and NG2 but when they differentiate into mature oligodendrocytes, they lose the expression of these markers and they start expressing other markers such as APC, CA2, or CNPAs, and myelinating oligodendrocytes express uh, other markers such as MVP. OLIC2 is a transcription factor that is expressed all along the oligodendroglial lineage. So we first analyzed the, the co-expression of OLIC2 and NG2 in BRDU-positive cells at uh, 14 and 21 days compared to two hours. And here you see uh, the fraction of the BRDU-positive cells that express NG2 and OLIC2, meaning the OPCs. And you see that between two hours and 14 days, there is a sharp decrease in the, the fraction of the newborn cells that express the OPC markers. And conversely, here we looked at the fraction that express OLIC2, but that do not express NG2, corresponding to mature oligodendrocytes, and we saw an increase uh, in the fraction of these uh, mature oligodendrocytes. 
Then we also looked at uh, other markers that are uh, expressed in mature oligodendrous site, namely APC and uh, CA2 for carbonic anhydrase 2. And we could detect a newborn cells that express APC and CA2 at the 14 and 21 days. So only a fraction of uh, the newborn cells express these markers, and there was no uh, difference between the the non-pregnant and the pregnant rats, suggesting that at least for these two markers, uh, pregnancy does not alter the, the fate uh, of the, the newborn cells. So the next question was to determine the, the function of, uh, of these newborn cells. So for that purpose, we blocked cell proliferation by uh, infusing uh, an antimitotic, so RAC, selectively in the medial preoptic area uh, using cannulas connected to osmotic mini pumps. And we performed this infusion for uh, 21 days. And this period encompassed both the estrus cycle and the following major part of the pregnancy. And we monitored pregnancy and maternal behavior. And we were particularly interested in maternal behavior because the, the medial preoptic area is really a key center uh, in the organization of, the, uh, of maternal behavior. So here you see the body weight of the mothers during pregnancy. And uh, as you can see, uh, the antimitotic drug had no effect on the body weight of the mothers. It also had no effect on the length of gestation or on the number of pups per liter, suggesting that uh, there was no drastic effect on pregnancy. We then looked at maternal behavior. So maternal behavior is a complex behavior that comprises uh, a number of uh, different behaviors, such as nest building, leaking, grooming the pups, retrieving them to the nest, or uh, nursing. And we collectively uh, named these uh, behaviors in-nest behaviors, as opposed to the out-of-nest behaviors uh, in which the mother is uh, away from the nest and uh, drinks or uh, uh, um, take water input, sorry, uh, drinks or eat, sorry, drinks or eat. And so uh, we found that uh, RAC treatment significantly diminished the time spent by the mothers caring for their pups. And when we looked more specifically at the different behaviors, we found that the nursing in the hard back position was the most affected behavior. Right, so the, the next question that we have just started to, to tackle is to understand how these uh, newborn oligodendroglia lineage cells Uh, can impact uh, the neurons involved in uh, the control of maternal behavior. And interestingly, during our neuroanatomical study, we found that the newborn cells were frequently uh, located very close to, uh, to known cell bodies. Approximately 50% of the newborn cells were morphologically associated to, uh, to neurons. And here uh, you see an example of a newborn cell that is very close to uh, a galanin in positive neuron, so a neuron expressing galanin and, uh, and GABA. And uh, this population is particularly uh, interesting because these neurons have been uh, specifically involved in the control of maternal behavior. So to conclude, uh, we have shown that pregnancy is associated with the production of new oligodendroglia lineage cells, specifically uh, in the medial preoptic area. And these oligodendroglia lineage cells are important for the correct expression of maternal behavior. And probably by modulating uh, neurons important for the control of maternal behaviors through mechanisms that uh, remain to be identified. And with this, uh, I'm done. And I would like to, to thank the two talented PhD students who performed that project, Juliana Pellegrino uh, and Marion Martin. And I thank you for your attention.
Well, thank you very much, Ariana, for this very interesting talk. So uh, we have to move on. So I going to Nicolas Renier, who's interested in the study of how hormones do a pregnancy uh, can shape maternal behavior. So he's going to talk about uh, the midbrain peptidergic neurons and how they enable maternal nesting. Nicolas? Yeah, thank you so much, Julie. <clears throat> and thank you, everyone uh, connected to attend this webinar. So um, I'm going to uh, present uh, this uh, story for which we started at the beginning um, of um, my team back in 2020. And uh, as you've seen in the past uh, two lectures from uh, Julie and Ariane, is, uh, of course, uh, a lot of these social behavior and parental behavior we are studying are supported by uh, circuits that are uh, more or less uh, hardwired in the, in the, the brain. And, uh, um, something that is uh, very, uh, that actually both Julie and Ariane showed uh, is that it's not uh, really uh, completely hardwired and they don't really function the same way throughout the life of the animal. So if you take, for instance, um, a lot of these centers that are known to be associated with social behaviors or parental care or aggression, um, it is known, uh, and many other studies uh, uh, can have shown uh, from Catherine Dulac and others that, for instance, mating can shape um, these uh, different behaviors. So, for instance, here in the case of males, and we'll hear more about this in the talk of Christian Boberger, the, the behavior will uh, be affected by uh, parenting uh, uh, just after mating, where, for instance, they will tend to change the way they interact with pups. And so um, one, of, one of the great studies done recently on, on the plasticity of these behaviors was done by uh, John Nicole, uh, focusing on these uh, MPOA neurons that uh, Ariane talked about, where uh, using uh, fiber photometry and activity imaging, uh, Johnny could see the implication of these specific neurons in different behaviors, but also comparing pregnant females and virgin females, and here showing, for instance, that the activity that is recorded in those neurons uh, to the exposure of pups during sniffing is much higher in pregnant females than in virgin females. So there's definitely a lot of plasticity in the response of those uh, circuits, uh, depending on the, the stage and the life um, history of the animal. And uh, something that we were interested in is that uh, in that particular study, uh, nesting was not really, uh, nest building was not uh, one of the behavior that was affected by these uh, MPOA uh, plastic neurons. And um, we felt that this is interesting because uh, nest building, as um, uh, Ariane mentioned, can occur uh, within the nest in the presence of pups. So when mice uh, have um, uh, delivered their pups, they will build a nest around them to protect them. So it's uh, very important for uh, their reproductive fitness. But something that is also known is that you don't actually need to have the pups in the cage for the mice to engage in this maternal nesting behavior. And here is a very old uh, study that uh, is a classic study that shows that if you give access to nest building material to a um, female mouse, when the mouse is a um, virgin, uh, she will build very simple structures. But during pregnancy, you can see on the right that the mice will build very complex uh, structures. So completely independent uh, on the pres uh, of the presence of the pups, the, the mice can build these uh, complex uh, nest structures. And so we were interested in trying to understand how uh, pregnancy can regulate this particular behavior. And so that's the, um, the work of uh, uh, Tomek Topilko, a, a PhD student in the lab, and he was uh, uh, supported during this work by um, Patricia Gaspar, Katarina Pacheco, Silvina Diaz, and Florin Verni that were also in the lab. So it's really a, a big team uh, effort to try to understand this. So here are uh, time-lapse movies that are showing exactly what I meant. So here you see an accelerated movie of a mouse in a cage. Uh, this is a virgin mouse and the mouse is going to sleep soon. And uh, um, you see that the mouse is not really interacting much with the nesting material that we gave um, her. Uh, eventually the mouse will pull the nesting uh, material in the corner of the cage and then shred a little bit this nesting material, build a very simple structure and then sleep. If you take the same mouse uh, during pregnancy, in the mid-pregnancy stage, then you see that most of the time of this one hour video 
is uh, used to build uh, the nest. And uh, the nest that is being built by this uh, pregnant female is incomparably uh, much more complex and, and is actually more protective than the nest that the virgin female uh, built. So the, uh, this is not a, a behavior that happens randomly throughout the day. And by uh, doing a long story short, what we noticed is that actually, so it is known that nesting uh, in the mouse, it happens preferentially before sleep. So there is a sequence in which the mice are going to sleep and they're going to start nesting. And here you see an event plot of a virgin mouse nesting in uh, red. And then the mouse will start grooming in yellow and then sleep in, in blue, green. If you take a pregnant mouse, you see that the amount of time that the mouse spends nesting before sleeping is actually extremely extended uh, by the, the pregnancy. So what we wanted to understand is the, how is this process uh, regulated at the whole brain level? And for that, we wanted to use uh, a technology that we developed in the team uh, and before during my postdoc uh, to understand the specificity of the brain region. And this is um, a technology based on whole brain imaging with like chip microscopy and tissue clearing. So uh, we have this iDisco uh, tissue clearing protocol, which we combine with um, algorithm to map the location of those uh, false positive neurons in the brain to be able to do statistics. So the, the way it works is that you have this transparent mouse brain and you immunolabel them without slicing them uh, for CFOS. CFOS will be a protein that responds to the behavior of the mouse that shows uh, changes in neuronal activity levels, uh, more or less. And then uh, we can build this sort of uh, statistic maps that show uh, what are the differences between different groups of brains that we aligned to a reference atlas. And so, we did that uh, by using different types of animals that were building nests. So we had virgin females, pregnant females, uh, mated males, virgin males, and pseudo pregnant females. So we had the, all these mice building nests, and then we uh, gathered the 3D false expressing data, and we tried to find regions that were common to all group of mice. So sort of like general nest building region that are not dependent, dependent on the pregnancy and then regions that were specifically more, more high in the pregnant females or the pseudo-pregnant females. So here is sort of a volcano plot of those brain regions. So an important region that we were happy to see in the common to all group is the zona incerta, which uh, is, seems to be a very important and novel region to control these sort of object-directed tasks in the, the mouse. But there was a region that uh, caught our interest called the edinger vesrol region, which was specific to the pregnant females. And that was um, surprising because uh, edinger vesrol is, is not in the hypothalamus, so it's not part of the classic core of parental uh, nuclei. It's located in the midbrain, and uh, uh, it's wedged under the aqueduct and under the periaductal brain. And uh, uh, here are the map data that we saw where more or less what, you, what is important to see is this green uh, hotspot in this region shows that uh, the pregnant nest builder have a st strong increase of activity in this region. So the, the thing important that we needed to understand is what are the nature of these neurons that are expressing this uh, activity marker during pregnancy during and nest building. And um, what we saw is that they, they were a population of uh, neurons that uh, express your contin one and other uh, neuropeptides. Uh, uh, so for instance, CART and CCK are also expressed by these neurons. And uh, these neurons were selectively more activated during pregnancy. They were also activated in the virgin nest builder, but more in the pregnant nest builders. And so what was very interesting to us was uh, that this is a um, a strange population of neurons that is um, only peptidergic. They don't express fast neurotransmitters. They only express neuropeptides. And those neuropeptides are uh, the main ones would be your cortin one CART, and uh, cholecystokinin. So what we did is we tried to more precisely uh, look at the activity of those neurons during nest building. And for that, we use fiber photometry. So we labeled those neurons with a CART CRE driver, and we um, um, looked at their activity pattern in the um, day of the mouse. So 
clearly those neurons, they were very active. Every time the mouse would wake up, they would uh, uh, start being extremely active. And uh, oppositely, when the mouse would go to sleep, they would have a little surge of activity just before sleep, and then they would shut down during sleep. Um, and they have actually a, a strange activity pattern during sleep that we are not going to go into. But what we noticed is that every time the mouse was initiating nesting, there was a small increase in the already high activity of these uh, calcium activity of these neurons. So they were selectively active, a little bit more active around nesting. Um, so what we did is we tried to chemo uh, genetically inhibit those neurons using uh, the inhibitory dreads, and we saw that when we were doing that, the time that the mouse would spend nesting before sleep was decreasing, and they actually would spend more time sleeping overall uh, during the day of the experiment. So there seemed to be that these neurons might be co-regulating this sort of sequence when the mouse is going to sleep and it are important to maintain maybe a strong nesting activity before sleep. And so to test that, we also used optogenetics where we um, uh, stimulated those neurons in virgin females, so not pregnant females. And we saw that in 20% of the case, when we send a pulse of light uh, of these neurons, the mouse will start initiating a nesting uh, sequence. So um, confirming the, the fact that these neurons might actually be important in uh, initiating or maintaining this uh, nesting uh, sequence. So what about the interaction between the pregnancy and these hormones? So um, to do that, we used actually the same uh, uh, tool that uh, Julie was using, the caspase 3 uh, ablation uh, in, the, in this region. And so here, this is an experiment where we implant progesterone in the mouse. And then you see that uh, in the norm that is already known that in normal mice, it will trigger nesting. Uh, there, so here we are doing day after day, the number of mice that will uh, build a nest after a progesterone implant. And if you are missing these neurons, the, the response to progesterone is actually very blunted in the group of mice. What we saw is that if you patch those neurons, they have three different types of activity patterns, uh, evoked activity patterns, so bursting or repetitive. And if you add progesterone to those neurons in the bath, you see that actually the, the neurons will start to enter a bursting uh, mode. So our hypothesis is that the, the change in the firing pattern can be elicited by progesterone in those neurons and might actually be uh, driving uh, the action of those neurons um, behaviorally. But so to do a segue with uh, Christian Broberger talks, uh, what about the males? So the males, they also build uh, nests, but they don't build better nests when you mate uh, them. So here you have a control and mated male, the amount of time they spend nesting is not changed. And what we know uh, also is that if you add, if you inject progesterone in adult males, they will not start like the female doing uh, good in nests. So they don't respond to that in terms of nesting. And what we noticed is that the, those particular neurons in the males, they are missing a specific uh, progesterone receptor, PAQR5, which is a membrane progesterone receptor. So the males don't have that receptor. And also the males, uh, in vitro don't respond to the addition of progesterone if you add progesterone. So the neurons of the males don't respond to progesterone. So our work in progress that we are trying to elucidate now is whether this could explain the difference in nesting behavior between males and females. So to conclude here, um, we moved a little bit out of the hypothalamus and we showed that uh, some neurons could be also hormonosensitive uh, in the midbrain and might actually be broadcasting hormonal signal to the rest of the brain to modulate a parental behavior. And um, we have a full story that's in preprint uh, now, if you are interested. And um, also, uh, I'm happy to, to discuss more uh, later and during the discussion. So uh, this is the lab. Uh, we are uh, interested in hiring postdoc if some of you are connected. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, to, uh, for attending. And back to you, Julie. Thank you very much, Nicola. Very interesting talk. So now we're going to move to our final talk by Christian Proberger, who's going to talk about brain and neuroendocrine mechanisms of male parental behavior. Thank you, Julie, and thank you to FENS for organizing this uh, session, which I'm enjoying a lot. So I'd like to tell you a little uh, about uh, work that we've been doing in my laboratory, focusing 
uh, and it fits nicely with what uh, Nico closed with their male parental behavior. We're generally interested in instinctive um, innate behaviors. And that of course includes parental behavior, which is well studied as you've seen great examples of in uh, the female. Uh, just see if I can switch that. But uh, less studied in the male as uh, visualized here in a iconic poster from Sweden trying to promote men to take time off to take care of their kids. What we don't, especially don't know particularly much about is what um, goes on in the brain when you express these behaviors or especially when men express these behaviors. And the work I'm gonna show you is the work of a very talented graduate student, former graduate student, Stefano Stagurak is currently pursuing postdoctoral work at Caltech. So um, the story starts in a system that we've been spending quite some time on in the past decade or so, uh, which is located in the hypothalamus where you've already spent a lot of time. Um, this is the arcuate nucleus where you can find an interesting group of neuroendocrine neurons that use dopamine as a transmitter. They're called tuberinfundibular dopamine neurons or TIDA neurons for short. And in brief, what they do is that the dopamine is released in neuroendocrine fashion and transported that way towards the anterior lobe of the pituitary where dopamine can act as a suppressor of release or prolactin, a hormone that you already heard about, which is named for its ability to promote milk production. It also has the capacity to decrease fertility, uh, has effects on food intake, and importantly for this story, promotes maternal behavior. So really a hormone that is very important for all sorts of maternal functions. And it's perhaps no surprise then that prolactin also increases dramatically in blood of a female that has recently given birth or rather in the, actually in the late days of, of pregnancy. And dopamine acts as a powerful suppressor here. Now, uh, when we started working on these neurons, we uh, started uh, subjecting them to electrophysiology and we did it in the male rat was our model um, organism at the time. And what we could see is that these neurons uh, display an impressively robust and rhythmic electrophysiological behavior in the form of synchronized network oscillations. In order to make use of all sorts of genetic tools, we decided that we were gonna transfer this work to the mouse um, in the, as it turned out, somewhat naive assumption that the system was gonna operate exactly the same in the young male mouse as it does in the young male rat. Uh, and we were at first disappointed and surprised to find that this was actually not the case. These oscillations can still be seen in the male mouse, but they're different in a couple of regards, and perhaps most notably in this context by the fact that they are much faster in the mouse than they are in the rat. So the typical oscillation in the rat hovers around uh, 0.2 hertz and in the mouse around 0.4 hertz. So about double. So I, I said a lot, it's actually not a lot in the, in the landscape of brain oscillations. A, a doubling of frequency does not seem like a lot, but it turns out to have significant consequences. Um, we did uh, a lot of work to investigate what that could be because we also realized that they were actually uh, oscillations are not synchronized in the mouse and to make that story which I will not go into very brief uh, this change in network configuration between the mouse where oscillations are fast and cover actually a wider range of frequencies and in the rat where these oscillations are slow and very stereotyped and uniform, the difference could be traced to the fact that in the rat, these neurons are uh, very strongly uh, linked together by uh, gap junctions, electrical synapses, whereas in the mouse, in the male mouse, we don't see any evidence of gap junctions at all. So that was in terms of cellular mechanisms what could explain the differences in, in uh, network configuration. But we were curious also, does this have any implication for behavior and physiology? Does this actually mean anything for the animal? So what, what are the effects on behavior and physiology? Now, uh, in order to uh, address this, we had to, to think quite a bit, but of course, as I mentioned already, this system is very well characterized 
in the female and has all these roles in maternal physiology and behavior. It's not particularly well characterized in male, male and it's been a bit of a, a conundrum uh, why males do make prolactin at all. There are a number of other functions associated with prolactin, but none are quite as, as um, impressive as they would, if you will, uh, as they are in, in the maternal state. So now there were hints in the literature that prolactin could be uh, have a role also in male parental behavior. So we decided to pursue that. And Stefanos uh, designed a, a number of experiments to address this, working his way through the chain of events that eventually uh, leads to prolactin secretion and downstream effects of prolactin. So he decided to start at the tidal neurons themselves, which have this different in oscillation configuration and uh, see if he imposed these different rhythms that we had recorded between the mace, between the mouse and the rat upon the terminals of the tidal neurons using optogenetics and then recorded dopamine release if frequency of uh, discharge was linked to differences in the amount of uh, transmitter that came out of these terminals. So these are the results here. And he used fast scan cyclic voltammetry to measure dopamine release while he was imposing these different oscillation rhythms uh, by optogenetic means. Now, um, uh, if you look first, perhaps in the faster oscillation, the one that we typically find in the mouse, you can see that when he starts uh, exposing terminals to this frequency, he gets a very rapid increase in dopamine release, but then it drops up very quickly. It's as if the terminals are not able to keep up with this oscillation frequency. When he then subjects terminals to the oscillation frequency that we typically find in the rat, we do find this sharp increase again in dopamine release, but here the release then stays at a high level continuously until you stop stimulating and then it drops off. And that suggested that quite as we had predicted that in the rat, you have a lot of dopamine and in the mouse, you would have much less dopamine released here. So we continue to follow this uh, chain events and see if, if that diff species difference uh, continues also further down. So the next step is to look what happens to prolactin, which of course is inhibited by dopamine release. So he measures prolactin in the blood of uh, mice and rats, and he looks both in virgin and in father uh, rodents. And then you can see that in the rat, these animals, whether they're virgins or whether they're fathers, have very low prolactin, but in the mouse, the blood levels of prolactin are significantly higher, again, regardless of whether they're virgins or their fathers. So that suggests that this difference uh, continues further down the chain with now this opposite effect, so to speak, with if you have, if you're a rat and you have high dopamine, you also have lower prolactin. If you're a mouse and you have low dopamine, you now have higher prolactin. So where do we go next? Well, what we, uh, then hypothesized what this, this could be seen as an effect on parental behavior. And of course, you've heard in the previous talks about the beautiful work coming out of Catherine Dulac's laboratory that has highlighted a group of neurons in the medial preoptic area that express the neuropeptide galnin as critical for parental behavior. And, and, and Catherine and her colleagues had shown that this was true, not just for females, but that this region was also might be important for male parental behavior. So Stefanos first wanted to look if these neurons were responsive to prolactin and he did electrophysiological recordings on identified MPOA galanin neurons and could see that they very potently respond to prolactin by depolarization and start firing. Now, in terms of the species difference, he then looked for evidence of activation of neurons in this area and uh, when you're looking at effects of prolactin, the uh, first way you would, you would do it would not be as Nico showed by CFOS, which is of course something that is, is a general uh, uh, readout of activation neurons. But in prolactin, we have an extra benefit in that there is a signal transducer that's relatively specific to the prolactin receptor pathway in MDN 
the phosphorylation of STAT5, so PSTAT5. So read out here. And then you can see that in the mouth, in the rat, with its low prolactin, you hardly see any activation at all of these neurons, whereas in the mouse, there is strong activation of this area, these neurons implicated in parental behavior um, in, in a fashion that then is compatible with uh, prolactin signaling. So now we've gotten all the way to behavior. So Stefanos now looked at behavior and he does this relatively simple pup retrieval paradigm where you quite simply leave the parent, often a female, but in this case, a male, the father, um, in a cage with nesting material, as well as uh, his pups. And then you just leave them for an hour and you just see what happens. Now, in the rat, this is the typically what you find, and now you come back an hour later, and you can see that there has been not particularly much interaction with the pups at all. There hasn't been uh, much of nest building um, either. But if we look in, down in the mouse cage after an hour, we see a very different image where the mouse father has actually taken all of his pups, he's put them in the corner, made a nice little nest, and is now uh, hovering over them to keep them warm. Pretty much what we would see in the female. In the female, we should say in our experience, we don't see the species difference, but in the males, it's very uh, potent. So now we have a chain of events here that uh, ends up with non-paternal rats, male rats, and paternal male mice. So a chain of events, which is nice, going from oscillation frequency to differential levels of dopamine to differential levels of serum prolactin, a differential activation, of a key parental area of the brain and also a difference in behavior. But th there's no causality established here, right? So in order to see if we could establish causality, we, had, uh, we f uh, did three different um, sets of experiments, which I'll show you next. So for the first, we teed up uh, with some friends in New Zealand, David Grattan and uh, in his group, Rosemary Brown and Christina Smiley, who have for many years done beautiful work on prolactin. And one of the things they have uh, in their laboratory is a model where they can uh, conditionally remove expression of the prolactin receptor in particular brain regions. And uh, you may be familiar with uh, some very nice work they've done in the female brain, where they've been able to pinpoint the importance of prolactin receptors specifically in the medial preoptic area for maternal behavior. So here, they did the same experiment, but now in the males. And the first thing that they could show was that then when they remove uh, the receptor uh, from the MPOA of male mice, you also don't have any activation or phosphorylation of STAT5. Again, speaking to uh, the fact that this is a very good readout of prolactin receptor signaling. And then they looked at behavior in the pup retrieval test. And what uh, Christina could show was then that uh, pretty much in all the different parameters that she looked at when she had removed the prolactin receptor, she also saw uh, uh, much worse performance. Uh, for example, in pup retrieval, the amount of crouching and pup grooming, etc., in the animals that then sorry, I may have said uh, mothers here, I meant fathers if I said that. So this is all done in fathers, of course. In fathers, you need the prolactin receptor expressed in the MPOA in order to have parental behavior. Okay, so now we switch, we go to the rat, and we see if we can, we can do anything about this relatively poor parental performance if we now uh, supplement these uh, animals which have low serum prolactin with prolactin. So Stephanos injected male uh, rat uh, fathers with prolactin, and he looked at behavior. This is just showing one example, but of course we, we have uh, quantified this as well. So here, you can see what the what behavior the animal engages in in the presence of his pups for uh, an hour if he's been injected in saline and you see that he he essentially doesn't interact with the pups at all there is some uh, time when he's pr proximal to the pups but you know if you just aimlessly wander around the cage that is going to happen at some point right but if we inject the males with prolactin we now see a, a significant increase in how the proximity to pups, how much time they spend crouching over the pups. There's even some pup grooming. There isn't a whole lot of uh, pup retrieval. We have seen one or two examples of this, but 
uh, it's something we've never ever seen uh, unless we inject the male rats with prolactin. So that suggests that if you uh, increase serum prolactin in rats, you can get much more of expressions of parental behavior. And in the final set of experiments, we now aimed for looking at uh, trying to link this uh, difference that we started out with, namely the difference in oscillation frequency in tide endurance and see if we interfered at that level, could we also change the amount of prolactin release? Could we change paternal behavior? So these are experiments, again, in our mice uh, using our genetic model where uh, we have uh, the ability to use dopamine uh, cells uh, animals that express Cre in, in under the dopamine transporter and uh, get them to express some sorts of construct. In this, here we turned to an inhibitory opsin, halorhodopsin, uh, in order to uh, shape the frequency of oscillations. So uh, in, in the first experiment I showed you where we were driving the terminals, uh, we could use an, an excitatory opsin, channel rhodopsin, uh, working under the assumption that those terminals have been cut from the cell body. Now here, of course, we're going for the cell body. We have ongoing activity. So we have to use an inhibitory opsin to suppress the, or, or hyperpolarize neurons and then release them from that intermittently. And you can see here in these in vitro uh, recordings that this gives us very nice control uh, over oscillation frequency of these cells. So we do this in living animals, and uh, we of course have controls, you see those in gray, and we have the manipulated animals in green. Now this is a bit of a complicated graph here, but just start by focusing here. So here, Stephanos is subjecting the animals to the 0.4 hertz frequency. Now I remind you that this is the faster frequency, the, the endogenous frequency of male mice. Uh, so we're not really changing anything. And not surprisingly then, that also doesn't change serum prolactin levels. But if he now, uh, by these means, turn these neurons into oscillating at the rat frequency, slower frequency, 0.2 Hertz, you can see that he can significantly decrease serum levels of prolactin, suggesting a direct link between oscillation frequency and tidal neurons and uh, how much prolactin is released from the anterior pituitary. What about behavior? So that was the next experiment. And again, he's turning to the pup retrieval paradigm. And if we again focus at the 0.4 Hertz, the endogenous oscillation of mouse uh, tidal neurons, you can see that the mouse, male mice behave like male mice do, namely that left in a cage with their own pups, they're gonna take the pups and build a nice nest and collect them and then keep them warm. But however, now, if uh, you decrease the frequency to the slower rat frequency where we have the lower levels of prolactin, we also have much worse performance in the pup retrieval test with mice that don't take particularly well care of their pups. And that's just quantified here. So just to summarize this, since I'm running out of time, what we believe we have is a circuit-based mechanisms for uh, male parental behavior where the electrical coupling, or a difference rather, in electrical coupling between two otherwise relatively similar species determines the network oscillation frequency of a key neuroendocrine network. And that in turn dictates this output of that circuit in how much dopamine is released. We believe that we, with these data, can propose and that species differences in electrical wiring can actually explain a functional divergence and how, uh, two different species have developed different strategies for how they're gonna take care of their young. These data also implicate prolactin in a new role, namely driving parental care in males. And one thing that I mentioned to you, but I stressed very much, of course, you may have noticed that we had these similar prolactin levels, uh, whether the animals were fathers or not. And that suggests that uh, prolactin levels do not change with fatherhood, but we, our data do show that it's a necessary component, suggesting that prolactin has a permissive function in male parental behavior. And so with that, I'm gonna close. Again, just mention Stefanos uh, here who did 
most of this work, but also other colleagues on my laboratory were involved. And of course, we are very happy for the collaboration with our friends at the University of Otago in New Zealand. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Christian. So I'm sorry, a little bit running over time. Um, so let's uh, get into the uh, questions. Um, so I'm taking them a little bit in the order that they have been uh, asked. So the first question is actually for me. It's from Emilia Juric. I apologize if I do not pronounce your name correctly. So you're asking whether I also Kispeptins in the hippocampus. Uh, actually, for what I know, the the the, SDA, the receptor GPR54 is expressed indeed in the hippocampus. I don't think there is uh, any kispeptin protein that has been um, detected. Although there was some study uh, showing that there is message RNA kispeptin, so kis message RNA in the hippocampus, in particular in the dentate uh, gyrus. So yes, there could definitely be an effect in the a role of kispeptin also in memory uh, related uh, functions. I hope that uh, I have answered your question correctly. If not, please feel free to add another question, of course. So let's go to the second question. Um, I think this is probably for Ariana because it's also talking about uh, did you see more cells in other parts of the brain, the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus? Uh, I think that's for you, Ariana. Yes, I guess too. Uh, we have not looked at the hippocampus, but uh, there are previous studies that have been performed uh, to evaluate uh, proliferation and neurogenesis in the maternal hippocampus. So the experimental paradigm was different because they looked at proliferation in, uh, in pregnant uh, mice. But uh, up till now, there is no neurogenesis that have been uh, detected particularly, I mean, no enhanced neurogenesis uh, in pregnant uh, animals. There is, uh, as I showed you, increased neurogenesis in the SVZ olfactory bulb, but uh, apparently uh, not in the, in the hippocampus. Okay, thank you, Ariana. So I have a next question. This is from Tamara Franklin. This is for Nicola. So did you take brains at a set time point after you placed the nesting material into the cage, or did you use the start of nesting behavior as a start point? Some same sort of question for the first event plot you showed. Um, does it start immediately after placing the nesting material into the cage, or is it from as soon as they wake up? the first time in the dark period. Nicola? Yeah, thank you, uh, Julie, and thank you, Tamara, for the question. So I, I went a little bit fast um, on these points during the presentation, uh, but these are very important points indeed, um, because <clears throat> so when you add uh, the nesting material in the cage uh, so that we want to survey nesting, obviously all the mice will have a, a delay before they actually initiate the behavior. So the, the way that we decided to work on this is we had to make some decisions. So we always add the nesting material at the same time, which is very early in the morning so that the, we are catching the mouse just as they end up, they end the dark phase and, and they start to be ready to go to sleep for the light phase. So we, we add the nesting material then, and then we actually have a, vid, a camera that, uh, allow us to just uh, watch the mice uh, uh, from a distance remotely. And we count the initiation for every experiment that we do uh, when the mouse actually starts the behavior. So the CFOS mapping is done when the mouse actually starts the nesting behavior. And all the event plot that we show is also when the mouse starts the behavior. Uh, and not when we add the nesting material. So if you go on the preprint, there is actually more data on this. And, and uh, we show that actually in the pregnant females, the mice generally in, on average start nesting five minutes after the addition of nesting material. Whereas in the virgin females, you might have to wait one or two hours before they start initiating the behavior. So to make things more comparable, we always wait for the initiation of the behavior. Okay, thank you, uh, Nicola. I have another question actually uh, addressed to you from Charlotte Cornille. 
So she would like to know, uh, talking about the effect of progesterone on the firing rate of the urocortin one neurons, uh, it, that might be suggestive of a membrane initiated signaling. Would you please comment on this and maybe discuss how such a rapid and potentially transient action fits with the effect of chronic administration of progesterone on nesting behavior? Yeah, no, so that's a great question. And it's actually uh, something that we, that we need to to address uh, indeed in the in the near future because so we are as you said we are really convinced that the action that we see uh, in vitro is uh, based on uh, membrane progesterone receptors and we've seen that these neurons they do express a, a few different of these uh, genes so PAQR, PAQR5 and PAQR8 are two membrane uh, progesterone receptors expressed by these uh, neurons, for instance. Uh, so uh, the action of progesterone on those neurons is actually uh, fits with what we see in vitro. In vivo is more complicated because indeed the, the behavior in vivo takes many days to develop. So it's not something where you inject progesterone and you will see an effect on nesting just 10 minutes after. So what we, our working hypothesis is that either we are missing the expression of the nuclear receptor of progesterone, which at this point we could not detect in those neurons, but it might be expressed at very low level that we cannot detect, that will uh, induce uh, longer changes. Or another hypothesis is that actually the, the slowing down of the firing of these neurons by progesterone, by high level of progesterone, might actually uh, do long-term plastic changes to those neurons that may support, uh, that may need a couple of days to develop. And this could explain why we have a discrepancy between the in vitro effect, which is immediate, and the behavior which takes many days to develop. Okay, thank you, uh, Nicola. So I have a question, this is for Christian. It's from Harita Polagari. How comparable are dopamine levels of human males with respect to rats and mice? Are they more similar to rats or mice? Yeah, so unfortunately, this is a question we can't really get to in, in, in uh, humans, right? Because you would have to measure directly at the release site in the pituitary, which you would have to, to cannulate. So um, we, don't, we don't know that, and we'd love to find out. We also uh, don't know about the electrical behavior of this in humans. What we can study, of course, and we haven't done yet, is whether gap junctions, which are at the core of the species difference, are present in, in human tidal neurons or not. And, and so that's something we would like to get some tissue for. I mean, there's a question that's uh, more or less related uh, also to humans uh, from Charlotte Corneille. So she asked, what is the relationship between the controlled paternal behavior at prolactin and testosterone? Because in humans, a decrease of testosterone has been associated with fatherhood. Is this has been the case in rats? Um, yeah. I'm I'm racking my brain to, to, we haven't looked at the role of testosterone here, and I, I, I can't remember if that's been studied in the literature or not, sorry. Okay. So, don't, Chris, this, uh, this is actually one for me. This is from Nuria Ruitzre. Sorry about the pronunciation of your name. So, it's is it known which neurons in the media amygdala activates the kispeptin neurons in the hypothalamus, or is it a direct activation from the accessory effector? Well, this is, of course, a very interesting question and uh, that we are actually going to address as well, basically to see whether there is a direct um, link between the effector bulb and kispeptin neurons in the AVPV, or whether it's actually being processed through the amygdala, which of course we know is very important as part of the overall nasal system. So we are going to work on that. So, so hopefully the answer will be following in the upcoming uh, year. So let's go a question for Ariana. This is from Patricia Gaspar. Uh, she would like to know, do you think that the increase in OPCs that are close to galanin neurons increase the myelination uh, myelination and also do you know the signal and the hormone that is triggering this proliferation thank you patricia very interesting questions about the myelination uh, in fact we don't know yet we have not looked yet at the myelination but interestingly uh, it's been shown recently that the the satellite oligodendrocytes so that associate to the neuron cell bodies 
uh, are able to myelinate uh, axons. So this has been shown in the, in the cerebral cortex, in the hypothalamus we don't know, but maybe this is a, a possibility and that would be interesting to explore. And about the, the signals, so we don't know yet and we have just started to, to study uh, that question. So uh, I cannot give you an answer yet, but uh, uh, we have started to look at the expression of the hormone receptors, estrogen, progesterone, and prolactin receptors in the region, because they, we know they are uh, highly expressed in the region, but whether they are expressed uh, in OPCs in vivo, this is not known. So this is something we have started to look at. And uh, I hope in a few, <laughs> in a moment, I will be able to, to answer, but this we, we don't know yet. But there are already studies that have shown that uh, prolactin uh, increases oligodendrocyte production and myelination in the corpus callosum during pregnancy. And uh, so prolactin would be a good, uh, a good candidate. Okay, thank you, Ariana. So I have a question from Tom Smulders. This is for Christian. Uh, it was my impression that wild house mice are not monogamous. Is there paternal care under natural conditions? And if so, are males typically kept in breeding cages in a typical mouse breeding facility, or are we depriving them of natural behaviors? Oh, okay, that's, that's an excellent question. I, so we, of course, work under uh, relatively artificial conditions and 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 uh, the way we've studied mice is that there's no female around so uh, whether the male would uh, express parental behavior in a situation where it's a competitor uh, so to speak perhaps in a, a superior competitor we haven't looked at that but there are studies dating back to the 70s where where they compared um the behavior of males and females together and and there the males do um mice do express parental behavior um so that's not entirely natural conditions either but uh, at least it's it, it's with the females present um and you were asking if if we are depriving them of natural behaviors i mean i think that's definitely a yes when we the way we keep animals in 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 our facilities we are depriving them of of, of natural behaviors um I mean, we, we try to keep the families together uh, in experiments where we need to, but we haven't done that in this particular study because we wanted to look at a very clean situation with just the males with these pups. Okay, thank you, Christian. There's another question for you actually coming from Patricia Caspar. Are the neural, neural oscillations in female rats? And what about prolactin secretion? Is that also similar to male rats? Ah, yes, excellent question. So. So I've, of course, only spoken about the, the male, uh, which is where we started uh, studying the system, but uh, the question immediately presents itself, like, why wouldn't you look at a system that is so important for lactation and maternal behavior in the female? And we are, we are doing that. It's a, it's a large set of data that uh, from the postdoc in my laboratory, Rashid Amari, has, has collected. She does see oscillations in female rats. She has studied them over the... Um, uh, of the estrus cycle, they don't seem to change particularly much, but they do change quite a bit uh, with pregnancy. And what she also sees, which we think is fascinating, is that the, the when when the oscillations become faster, is that the neurons seem to uncouple through gap junctures, suggesting that neuronal wiring is very plastic in the system during conditions when you really need to change prolactin secretion. Now, in terms of prolactin secretion in 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 females. And that has been very well studied. It does change over the estrus cycle um, with a peak around proestrus, pro estrus, uh, depending on exactly on which species you look at there. Uh, again, we haven't seen so much differences in, in the frequency of oxidation, suggesting that that only happens when you need a long-term change in prolactin secretion, which you do when the animal goes into, into the lactation state. Okay, thank you, Christian. So there's another question uh, for Ariana from Charlotte Cornu. Uh, do you know what is the nature of the cells labeled with BRDU in the preoptic area across the estrocycle? cycle? Any idea of their function? Uh, indeed, uh, these are the OPCs because when we labeled them, it was two hours after the BRDU injection. So uh, these are the cells that express uh, OLIC2 and NG2. And we started also to compare the 
the expression of the cells born in the different phases of the stress cycle. And it seems that it's the same. Uh, almost 80% of the BRDU positive cells are uh, expressing OLIC2 and NG2, whatever the, the phase of the stress cycle. Well, thank you, Ariana. So there's a question from Patricia Caspadis for me is regarding the uh, induction of sex specific mating behaviors and to what extent is this mating behavior related to parental behavior, for example, are mice where kispeptin neurons are all that capable of parental behavior? Well, this is a very interesting question and I really do not have the answer in that I we have not really been studying any of our uh, KISS uh, or GPR54 knockout mouse models uh, for uh, parental behavior. Um, so um, yes, I don't know, uh, maybe some of the other uh, speakers, and because I was thinking about any hormonal regulation, of course, of uh, parental behavior. We know, of course, this has been highly disturbed in, in, in kiss knockout mice or, or in GPR54 knockout mice. So could any, Nicola, Christian, or Ariana comment on this? Look at, looking at hormonal regulation of parental behavior. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's not dependent on hormones uh, in, in mice or big science. <laughs> well, well, we'll look it up for you, uh, Patricia. <laughs> we'll have a, a look. So um, I see we have about two minutes left. So if any of you, the participants still have any uh, urgent questions, now is the time. Please don't be shy. Merci, Vincent. <laughs> so I guess uh, that we can then sort of close the session. So thank you very much for being here, for listening. And as I understand, it's it's, it's recorded. And uh, so you can always look back later if some of the things you missed at all. So, well, bye, bye to everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.